Today, more from the investment manager's front line. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to Ideas Post, covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Today, I'm joined again by Tony Lacantro from Alto Capital. Hello, Tony. G'day, Martin. Uh, always a pleasure to be back. It's, uh, it's certainly a weird time. I know that this social isolation is having a bit of an impact. Uh, I read today that it takes someone 66 days to have a behavioural habit, so to speak. So the longer this goes on, uh, the worse it's going to get. Yeah, well, I think that uh, people are beginning to realise that the social implications and the psychological implications of what's happened, you know, are very serious. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's there's a horrible trade off somewhere between the direct medical impact of getting the virus and all the impact of that versus the fact that people are being socially isolated and all of those things. And of course, the economy's uh, gone to hell in a handbasket too. This is a wicked problem. It's massive. I mean, I liken this to, you can imagine you go to the movies on a Sunday and you go to a Back to the Future movie marathon. And then as you're walking out of the cinema on a Sunday, I normally check my footy tipping results, which are normally crap. <laughs> and then suddenly you're hit with reality. So that when you're sitting in the movie theatre, it's great. Uh, but then suddenly, once reality hits, and I think we're still in shock at what's happened. You've just pretty much had the economy. It's been thrown under a bus. I mean, I, I walked around Kings Park yesterday in Perth and walked around all that commercial property. And I'm thinking, no one's going to need this because companies are going to realise you don't need a flashy marble entrance and these spacious offices to do business. And I read Optus even are saying now some of our staff can work from home. So you're going to obviously, I see some big investors are shorting commercial property, but that's just that's just the start of it. And I know some days I'm, I'm absolutely negative about what's happening, but some days I feel more negative than others. <laughs> so yeah. you could ask me to pick one day, the next one it, it changes. But this is this is unprecedented. This. This is scary shit, Martin, and I think it's going to hit once we come out of the shock phase. Well, I think that's right, and I'm still of the view that many people, and including many economists, have still got this rose-tinted, you know, it's going to be a V-shaped recovery, everything will spring back to where it was, you know, and it's like we have this short, sharp uh, nightmare, but it's over. I'm afraid that I don't have that view. I think that, one, the virus itself will run on for a lot longer because there will be, you know, a vaccine maybe in 18 months time, but maybe not. Um, meantime, there will be probably waves of uh, infections, um, you know, if not here, then around the world. The second point is that though the economic changes that this will wrought, you know, the digitalization, as you say, in terms of, you know, people won't need large offices. Um, some types of business will have already gone out of business. We know that for a fact from our surveys. Uh, others will be very much taking a long time to recover. And what I believe is that um, you might see the downside coming down the escalator, so it drops quickly, but you have to go up the stairs to get back. And those stairs will take two to three years probably to plod back up to where anything like where we were. But the world has changed, and the world has changed quite dramatically. Um, and think about what this will do to international trade and, you know, what we do onshore versus what we do offshore. Think about what it does in terms of the, you know, the mix of products and services that people will want in the future relative to now and how they're going to be delivered. There are so many radical changes. And in the midst of it, we still do not know how long the health crisis itself is going to run for. So, yeah, to my mind, a V-shaped recovery is just a pipe dream. It's not going to be like that. Yeah. I admit I'm seriously outspoken. I'm a bit loud. I tell it how it is. And a lot of these economists are yet to block me on Twitter, which I appreciate. But I read Chris Joy's article and I thought, wow. I mean, I've got to respect. I, I call the AFR the in-betweeners. Right? Mm. So we're the DFA people, we're the Looney Tunes, right? And then you've got the mainstream, that those that watch Seven News, and then AFR's right in between. It's something you flip through over a coffee. But to say we're only going to have a 5% correction, then 20 to 30% capital growth 
on this cycle, what the hell is he thinking? Sorry, you're wrong. I mean, he's saying I'm a contrarian. No, he's saying this pen that's propped, that's popped the most overvalued property market on earth is not a pen. That's all it is. I mean, the contrarian view of saying it's overvalued is now coming to the fore, and he's trying to be a contrarian on a contrarian. I think this is a Deadpool four wall joke. I don't know, but let, let's 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 imagine this, Martin. You a family, right? He's saying, well, if you uh, the partner works in a cafe and their job goes, it's not going to affect mortgages. Well, that's a load of crap because it's that that's that cafe job plus the bank and mum and dad plus all these hidden loans and gifts from everywhere that made up the mortgage. Now, I can imagine a married couple sitting together over a cup of coffee with zero to nil financial literacy thinking, okay, let's sell the treadmill. Too late. The panic buying in treadmills has happened. Let's sell the freezer. Too late. Then suddenly, oh, let's sell the house. Didn't that kind agent say our house is worth $1 million? Well, no, it's not. It's not anymore. That was an illusion. So suddenly, can you imagine all the families in suburbs having the same conversation? And that's the people in trouble. Can you imagine the older people, just say Hurstville, Cogra area, their house is worth $1.8 million, they paid 50 grand for it. They want to cash in their lotto win as well. Into a market where there's zero buyers, buyers are backpedaling. To me, that's a collapse. That's how dot-com stocks collapse. That's how battery metal stocks collapse. That's how 1987 collapse. I don't know what drugs some people are on, but it's a speculative bubble. It's fueled by debt. Uh, I value, like, let's look at the median price of Sydney. It's about a million dollars. So half of that upside is confidence. That's all it is. Confidence and cheap money and the view that this miracle economy will keep going. So there's half a million dollars gone, evaporated. Yeah, well, that's, of course, the point. And uh, you know, I've discussed this before, but I'll discuss it again briefly. My long term modeling gives you a, a baseline view as to what property value should be based on all of the major ratios, income and uh, GDP and those sorts of things. Right. And our property prices, uh, certainly on the East Coast, are 40 percent above where they should be. Right. And that is absolutely, as you say, it's a combination of debt in fueled um, property price rises. And as you say, the uh, weird confidence that prices will only ever go up and it will never go the other way and everything's fine and, you know, all of those things. Right. But that that level departure from the mean is so significant that if it starts to slide, then the downward momentum will just cascade. And that's exactly what we saw in the US and in Europe, global financial crisis, uh, 2008, you know, and it took two years for prices to really settle down to their more fundamental values again, um, over there. And then it started to sort of take away again, because take off again, because there was still more debt. So so we, this is not something that's going to get fixed in a two months or three months, right? And the other thing to say is that uh, I publish um, my estimate of those households who are indicating to me in our surveys that they have to sell, right? Yeah. And they are having to sell. There's three categories. The first category are those who are looking to down trade. So they've actually been sitting on an equity pile Right. And they're now very, very scared. If they don't sell and quickly, the value of that's going to decline. So they are desperate to get out, get a bit of the equity and use it to support them into retirement. So that's the first group. The second group are those who bought very, very, very recently. And some of those actually on the 95 percent government back scheme, you know, with a 5 percent deposit. And they're already seeing the value of their property sliding back. And the third are the property investors, particularly those who've got the high rise uh, in, in some of the ma major centres. You know, these, these properties that were built, frankly, to a very low specification um, with a lot of default uh, faults in them. And now they are unable to actually let those properties because there's so much rental property on the market. There's 30,000 units in and around Sydney um, on the market at the moment, you know, for rental. A lot of those were ex Airbnb, who's completely gone off the boil now because of what's happened with the virus. And so suddenly the property investor set is now saying, hang on a moment, capital not going anywhere, returns from rental 30% down, if I can get anything. 
and I've still got all the issues with regard to cracks and risks of um, more defects later. No wonder property investors are trying to get out. Put all that together and you can see why it is that we're going to get back to a, um, you know, a much lower level of value. Plus, of course, you've got the other factor. People are insulated at the moment for a few months because of the interest and re repayment holidays that are there offered by the banks for a certain number of months. That will come to an end at some point. And the fact that the government is going to be funneling some money via the various schemes, via their employees, employers, I should say, to protect them a bit. But neither of those are actually long term permanent fixtures, right? They are short term spanning, you know, the idea to get to the other side uh, measures. But at some point they're going to disappear. And whenever that is going to happen, that's going to be the next leg down in terms of property prices, because then they'll have to sell. Yeah, and it's like calling a circuit breaker on the Dow Jones when it drops, starts to look as though it's going to drop a few thousand points. Mm -hmm. And then it's not, going to, it's not going to halt the issue. You can have no inspections, no physical options. That's not going to stop the fear coming in. And once the supply comes in, I believe it's going to be like trying to suck an ocean through a straw. <laughs> and let's face it, it's like owning a pile of pets.com and other shitty dot-com stocks on the day of the dot-com crash. There's just, you hear crickets, and I, I was sitting there in a broking office doing that. And what, what these economists don't understand, Martin, is speculative bubbles. The psychology, in my, in my job, even though some days I struggle to talk to people just based on what's going on, it's hard to talk to people all day, but I've dealt with thousands of people, and I know their aspirations, their risk tolerance, their nervousness to price changes. And it's funny that what's happening now is there's very limited part of the population are actually interested in what, what you're saying. And I went back and had a look at your 60 minute stuff and it was spot on, but it's all glossed over by these, the market's okay. And it's, this is really devastating. There's, none of us want this to happen, but I'm not going to turn around and say, no, everything should be right, mate, because it isn't. Well, and there was an article that Domain published saying for first time buyers, this is a great time to buy because you've got less competition from other people trying to get into the market. Right. And uh, the banks are very willing to lend, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, this is the last time that you would want to get into the market for the first time at the moment because you're going to lose your capital. You know, and it's always the issue people stop and need to think if they've saved up 10 percent and they're actually going to buy a property and you get a 90 percent mortgage and values drop 10 percent, who loses you lose that 10%. So every dollar that you've saved disappears. And if prices go on falling beyond that, you still owe the amount of the mortgage to the bank, whatever the property price does. And if you're not careful, you end up in negative equity. And, you know, there are stories around the world of, in the UK and in Ireland, as well as in the US, where people 10 years later are still stuck in properties that are worth less than the mortgage that they have on them. And that is a very, very debilitating thing to get involved in. So I would say to anybody who's a first time buyer, be really, really, really careful. Don't be misled by all the spruikers because they are absolutely everywhere at the moment. And they're in the mainstream media and they're in real estate land as well. They're all trying to but they're all trying to do the obvious thing, which is to try and pull the wool over people's eyes so that effectively they can get a transaction. Why? because they need transactions to make any money at all, right? Yeah, and, and, and they, they don't have to provide the advice because every buy and sell order I do as an advisor, I have to write a story behind it. I have to have a knowledge of the market. Yep. I'm not going to uh, put someone into the Commonwealth Bank at 50 times price earnings ratio. Why would I put someone in, into a house at the equivalent overvaluation? And people need to look at Perth. Perth, as I said, I was walking around Kings Park yesterday. This is a beautiful city. Mm. And in 2006, briefly, we were, had a higher medium price than Sydney. Those that bought in Perth around that time are still underwater up to 15 years later. And then no one looks at the true cost of it because you've got to pay interest, you've got to pay rates, all those costs. And, and people say to me, well, you called the top in the market a few years ago. Absolutely, I did. I think because stupid money can go on longer than what you think it can. But look at, look at it, how a homeowner would have been better by selling, not having to pay all those costs like maintenance and everything and be out of the market and now 
in, in a rental smorgasbord, because that's what it is now. You can go in and negotiate rents, and it's about the only thing that's going to survive will be the rental smorgasbord, not the food one, because who's going to want to go near one of them? Um, unless, yeah, it's just society's, society's going to change. Well, that, no, you're absolutely right. And of course, it's worth just reflecting. You know, if I take Mandurah, right, so that's that's my sort of archetypal Western Australian postcode, you know, south of uh, of Perth. Um, prices there are 30% down from where they were, right? And we know that the um, default rates now are 6 and 7% in, in that particular area. We know there are a lot of people who've been trying to sell and un unable to sell. And I was watching that three, four, five years ago as the mortgage stress indicator started to rise in that particular area, right? And I knew what was going to happen. And I actually sort of suggested that this would be a bellwether area to, to watch. Unfortunately, I'm now seeing precisely the same things happening down the East Coast in a whole bunch of different areas, right? So in a way, Western Australia is giving us a forward vision of what we're going to see more broadly down the East Coast over the next two to three years. And, and you know, it's almost unthinkable that there's a way that that can be stopped. OK, they will do some more first time buyer incentive schemes and they might even try and reform stamp duty and those sorts of things. But they won't be able to do what they've done the last two or three times, which is one, cut rates, interest rates, again, really aggressively, and two, um, essentially create more multiples of income to be able to actually get people to get ever bigger mortgages. That game's over, right? Absolutely. And and it's interesting that Phil Lowe in his speech earlier in the week said, look, the shadow of this this virus thing and the economic uh, outfall is going to be cast a long shadow. And he went on to say that income growth is pretty much going to be nowhere, certainly in the short term. He's more bullish than I am medium term. Um, I think that incomes are going to be pretty flat. And by the way, the other thing that people have forgotten about, uh, Tony, is that a lot of the properties that were being purchased, some of those were actually being purchased by people coming in from overseas, right? We had a migration rate of, what, 300,000 per annum for the last few years. How much migration is there going on at the moment? Zero. So that other dimension which was blotting up some of the supply in some places, it disappeared too. So you can almost um, say, tell me again, who's going to be buying property? And that's a very short list. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a still wildly overvalued market into no buyers. And I've seen that on the stock market. And we're seeing stuff in Australia you wouldn't think possible. Who would have thought you'd see Virgin Planes barricaded? from leaving, uh, these queues at Centrelink. Um, yeah. I mean, in the Great Depression, admittedly, they were wearing suits and top hats. And, you know, the social distancing. Who would have thought? And let, let's be realistic. Who would have thought that the share price of, say, a bank like Westpac would fall from $35 down into the 13s at one point, into the greatest eastern state's property bubble of all time? Things, things are going to change. And people have spoken about the benefits of cleaner air. Uh, less crime. Well, that's that's rubbish because all the crime is happening in the home, and you saw those calls to Lifeline, and the women under pressure and men with kids involved. That's gone through the roof. So they're going to have to expedite the court processes. Uh, we've already started to see some suicides. We've started to see assaults. Um, ben Cousins got arrested again, but um, I mean that was a break from what being what's going on. Oh, I mean whatever whatever runs in Perth, but. The health, mental health issues are huge. And as I said, you come out of a Back to the Future movie marathon and suddenly you're hit with light and that's what's mm. going to happen. I think a lot of people are actually going to get quite used to staying in their PJs all day. I mean, I sit there some days in my PJs running millions of dollars worth of shares. But again, who's going to need the massive office? Yeah. And those with the flash cars and the flash houses, who cares? I mean, this, this affects everyone. This yep. is going to affect, I mean, the, those on unemployment benefits got a bit of money. So we saw the guy with a boot full of VB. Uh, they can buy their cigarettes. Middle class under a lot of pressure because a lot of them don't actually qualify for any benefit. So then they've got, they've got no benefit. And the ultra wealthy, yeah, financially they can sit it out, but they're missing the social interaction that sparks joy for the ultra wealthy. They want to be seen donating. They'll be seen in the social pages. Everyone's affected and anyone that can come up with a list of positive in the short term, I think is delusional.
Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's probably right. And it's worth, worth um, reflecting. I spoke to Eddie Hobbs, who's a guy in Ireland, about what happened in Ireland when they had their crash, right? And, and we started talking about the financial issues and the property market falls. But he said, look, the real cost are the social costs, right? The real issues that we should be talking about are precisely those things of, of, of the violence and the mental issues and, you know, the generation of people who will be scarred by this, right? And he said, even, you know, 10 years later, there are still people in Ireland who are still trying to pick up the pieces from what happened. And I think that's a very, very important warning to people that this is not an economic conversation. This is actually fundamentally a social and psychological conversation, right? Because that's where the heart of this gets to, right? Yeah. And unfortunately, Tony, the thing that is also making it worse is the uncertainty, right? Because nobody knows whether this economic slowdown is going to run for a week, a month, a year. Nobody knows whether the virus is going to get, um, you know, nailed or whether it's going to come roaring back, back like in Singapore and other places. Even in China, they're now saying they've got, uh, you know, big accounts again. Um, this is a very, very uncertain environment. And I think the uncertainty and the lack of control and the lack of ability to be able to do the things you normally do all put together creates the psychological pressures that effectively get manifested in you know, all sorts of ugly ways. And for me, that's the real concern about this. And, you know, we, we've been speaking about this for some little time. I was speaking to other people, too. And we were warning. We were warning about the, the, the traps that were being laid. And unfortunately, the traps are being sprung now. Well, I thought the conversion to a less is more economy could evolve over a decade. Mm. You'd have the property bubble burst and things would start to normalise. But this is with a thud. This is yep. an absolute thud that we've had this less is more back, back to basics. But people don't realise is if businesses get back to basics, people lose jobs. If people don't spend, we're a 58% driven economy. There's no economy and there's going to be a lot of pain. And they're talking about the Great, Great Depression. Well... And you're right about the health issue. I've, I've started reading where people, it was in the Washington Post, I should have completed the article, we're saying that people that have had COVID, even the younger ones, are dying of stroke now. Yep. yep. There's going to be lots of issues with the lungs. So the long-term impacts, well, we don't know about them yet. Mm. And, I yep. mean, I believe, yeah, and so it's a huge issue. But I, I'm just here for affordability and realism. Whereas you've got people writing in papers saying that the biggest speculative bubble of our generation is going to continue. I mean, mm. WTF to that, Martin. Yeah, well, I agree. But I'm also equally concerned by a number of the journalists and uh, business commentators who are basically saying, look, you've got to just allow more infections because we need the economy back, right? So they're basically trading off health for economic outcomes and saying we can wear the health costs uh, because we need the economy back. I, I mean, I think that's a really, really bad trade-off. And just to make that point, you, you were talking about the article there. There was an article in Bloomberg, and they actually followed a number of people who'd been through the COVID experience and had actually had the, the ventilation and you know, been in a coma and those sorts of things. Only one-third of those who go through that treatment survive. Two-thirds don't. And the one third that do survive have long term health issues, um, you know, multiple health issues. So this is not going to be like getting over the flu. Right. Those people who are seriously impacted are actually going to be carrying the burden of this, you know, for many, many years. Um, so this is a really serious thing that you know the virus is it's not like flu and then the only unknown unknown is just what proportion of the population is is carrying it in some way in australia it looks as though it's very very low at the moment which gives us a chance potentially to get to zero you know maybe here and in new zealand that would be a fantastic outcome because we could put a ring fence then around that those two countries and you know control immigration and migration and movements around that but get back to a more normal life. My concern is that the pressures from business and the pressures from some of those uh, more right-wing writers will push the government to open the taps too quickly, and then we will get a, um, uh, a Singapore or you know a South Korea or whatever all over again, uh, and then we'll have to go back, lock it down, and start again. And that will just prolong the agony 
and prolong the economic disaster that, that awaits if we're not very careful. We need to be really, really cautious, I think, on opening the taps too soon because there is a chance we can get to zero. And if we could get to zero, that would be a tremendous outcome. Yeah, so I slowly reopen. But I think the message to viewers is that those obviously that aren't have huge amounts of debt, that have bought their physical gold and silver, that are trying to at least move the money around the banks, is stay the course. And uh, I think you know, everyone's had that benefit of your knowledge. And I mean, it's suddenly this is it's quite eerie that this is all evolved. But who would have thought a bloody virus has done it rather than common sense and a yep. simple exhaustion of buyers? It's truly bizarre times. And uh, I mean, I'm taking this isolation quite seriously. I can't afford to get sick. I mean, I've got a family and oh, I've got to guide clients through as as you do as well. So, um, but I just don't, I don't appreciate the BS I'm reading around the traps more. It's more of an ego driven. I mean, I've got an ego, but um, I'm positive, Martin. I'm positive things are absolutely stuffed at the moment. <laughs> Positively stuffed. That's a, that sounds a, a pr pretty good one. And, um, you know, it, it, what's interesting is that if you get some realism in the conversation and if, you know, I've spoken to quite a few people, right? People actually want to know what, what the reality is, not what some, you know, golden spun, super optimistic view of things are. They actually want the truth. They want to know. Right. And, and a lot of them are seeing through a lot of the mainstream stuff and a lot of the, um, you know, the, 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 the sort of the spinning of the of, of the positive yarn because they know it's they know it's not quite quite like that. Right. The truth is this is going to hurt. It is going to go on. Um, but I think we should also underscore there will be an exit point at some point. And, um, you know, if people are cautious and careful and, um, you know, hang in there for the duration, um, there will be an opportunity to craft a rather different economy beyond and uh, perhaps a more back to basics economy. And the final point I wanted to make was that for me, the virus is not to be blamed directly because this was always going to happen. We were always going to get this resetting, this uh, correction. It's just a question of when and how. The virus is the catalyst for something which was always going to happen. And uh, I want people to understand that, um, you know, it might have taken a bit longer without the virus there. But frankly, um, it's probably ultimately a cleansing that we have to have. And now the question is, if we lay the policies right for beyond, there is an opportunity to create a much more equal and opportunistic society than we've had over the last 20, 30 years. Yeah, it's just an absolute shame that a fair chunk of our middle class has been wiped out like they get wiped out in most speculative bubbles around yeah. the world. And all you've got to do with the speculative bubble is identify it and treat it and get out early. Always get out early because stupid money can go on for a long time, as we've found out. But uh, yeah, no, really appreciate it, Martin. Thank you, Tony. I appreciate your time today. And uh, we'll uh, pick up the uh, conversation uh, maybe a little bit later on, specifically on the, uh, the stocks and that area, because some people might be quite interested in that. But we'll do that as a separate show. Yeah, look forward to it. Thank Keep you. Keep safe. Thank you. Bye bye.